I completely understand that most of you that follow our channel already have an interface, but for those of you that don't, let's go ahead and take a look at some entry-level interfaces today, so stick around. Hello Internet, Chris Klein here with Alma Music Center in San Antonio, Texas. And before we jump into all these wonderful interfaces that we have here, I want to ask that you please uh, press the subscribe button down below if you haven't already. We're going to be bringing you more content that's centered around pro audio, keyboards, synthesizers, drum machines, other fun gadgets, and also be sure to look at our other channels that are centered on guitar, bass, accordion, piano, uh, all kinds of content to, to help you make better decisions and to help you be better informed as a musician, producer, whatever your path is in the music industry. So uh, we're gonna look at some of these interfaces today and we're gonna talk about how they might benefit you uh, if you're just starting to get into the recording game and you haven't made a decision yet. Uh, as you can see, we have no shortage of choices. We have a couple of bundles here, which are, uh, for, for the most part, all-inclusive uh, into your new foray into the home recording game, or if you want to start to uh, pursue the path of becoming a professional recording engineer. Um, so let's look at some of these bundles that I have from Focusrite and PreSonus. And then after we talk about those, we're going to move into uh, the individual interfaces that we have. And this isn't all that we carry, and there are unlimited uh, amounts of interfaces from uh, myriad companies today, but let's go ahead and look at our bundles first and talk about how these uh, might help you get started in the game. So the first bundle I want to look at today is the Personas AudioBox 96 Studio. Now, the reason I'm, I'm showing these bundles first is because, you know, as I had said, they're kind of you know, all-inclusive. Everything has been kind of integrated into this package that's going to help you as a brand new uh, home recording engineer, uh, or maybe you're on your path to becoming a professional engineer. It's gonna help you uh, with pretty much everything you need to get started. And so let's go ahead and unbox this critter and let's see what all we have here. So, doo -doo -doo, it's packed well. So here it is. Of course, you have your instructions, registration for the software. Uh, Presonus does have their own uh, DAW. Um, and you know, I don't know if that's something that you want to dive into or not. It's called Studio One. Uh, it is free, it is highly functional. Uh, I'm not real familiar with it, I am a Pro Tools guy. Uh, my suggestion is when you're getting into the game, jump into one of the DAWs that's more popular. Pro Tools being the most popular, it's in nearly every commercial studio around the world. And, and I'm not promoting, I'm not being paid to promote Avid's product. It's just I've used it forever. Every, almost every studio uses it, whether it be a commercial recording studio or commercial posting facility or, you know, Skywalker or any number of other, uh, you know, big posting houses. Uh, Pro Tools is kind of the norm. Um, if you're, you know, into electronic music and, and whatnot, then Ableton's very, very popular. If you are looking to get into composing, Logic is very popular. But uh, this package does come with PreSonus' uh, Studio One. It is a highly functional, easy to use DAW, so it might be something that you want to explore just so you can add more software into your own, uh, into your own knowledge base, your own databanks upstairs. Mine, uh, my databanks are starting to dump memory now, uh, but anyhow, let's move on. So we have the interface, it's metal, solid, solid build, stereo headphones with the cable, of course. You have a, a little tripod mic stand. Uh, this could probably be very, very functional if you are getting into the podcast world. You have a uh, condenser microphone. By condenser microphone, this, this is a powered microphone. It needs 48 volts for phantom power, which this will provide. Uh, standard uh, USB type A to type B cable to go to your computer, as well as a mic cable. Uh, and then, of course, you've got a, a little carrying pouch for your microphone. You have a pouch for your headphones. And here it is. Now, the interface, uh, again, rugged build. You have 
two dual inputs. So it's stereo or line, oh, excuse me, not, it, well it is a stereo input because you got two, uh, XLR um, or line. Now this is not a, these are not high Z inputs. So if you plug a guitar in here, the impedance is not gonna be matched and so you're probably not gonna get the same results that you would if you were plugging into something that is a true high Z input and then you feed that into an amplifier emulator within your DAW. So I, I do wanna be clear there. You have your uh, phantom power button, 48 volts. You have your uh, mic trim or your gain pots. Uh, I don't know how much gain these microphone preamplifiers offer. I'm gonna say probably in between 70 and 80 dB, which is pretty much the norm. Um, you also have uh, a mixer. So if you're wondering what the mixer is, this is going to let you blend the headphone outputs in between um, the imp the direct inputs or the inputs going into the box, so you're actually monitoring what's coming off of the inputs, or your DAW, and then you also have uh, your main output right here. So if we look at the back, one of the things that's really nice about this, and, and somebody had called me out on another video that I had done, um, th this actually has five pin uh, DIN MIDI inputs, uh, so you have a five pin MIDI in and out, so for those of you that have uh, out, uh, outboard gear or, or hardware instruments that have the five pin DIN norm, MIDI, uh, MIDI norm, you can actually use this as a MIDI interface as well, which is really, really nice. You have your main outputs left and right. You only have the two outputs for your monitoring system. And then of course you have your headphone output. I, I think it would be nicer to have the headphone output on the front, but there is a lot happening here. That's probably why they put it on the back. Uh, depending on who you are, this might not be a big problem. For me, it would be a little bothersome to have a, you know, a microphone, uh, excuse me, a, a headphone cable being plugged into the back of the device as opposed to the front of the device. So robust uh, sample rates uh, supported up to 96K. Um, you know, the, the converters on here, they're not the best, you're getting a full package for 300 bucks or right under $300, which is fantastic. But you're not gonna have the best converters. Now, if you're just getting started, you're also probably not gonna hear a lot of these things as well. But having the ability to go all the way up to 96K is still really, really nice because you will hear the difference if you're recording from 44.1 kilohertz, which, uh, which is the standard Redbook CD, uh, when you, and when you make that transition going up to 96K, you're gonna hear the difference because you're capturing a lot more harmonic content, significantly more. So this is uh, one of the packages from, from PreSonus. It should be noted that PreSonus does sell interfaces by themselves that support more inputs and outputs, better converters and whatnot. But again, we're, we're looking at you know, some entry level uh, packages here, entry level uh, interfaces, and this is a fantastic start uh, if you have not taken the plunge yet. So interface, headphones, mic cable, condenser mic, needs phantom power, USB, tripod mic stand, bag, DAW, right? Let's not forget about that, Studio One, and then all the information you need to get started. So next up, we have a couple of bundles from Focusrite. And really, the only difference between the two bundles is the actual interface. So we have the Solo and the 2i2. So let's go ahead and unbox the Solo. And then I'm also going to take the interface out for the 2i2 bundle. So let's go. Ooh. Sexy. Wow, this tape is really, there we go. It was really sticky. There we go. So with both the Solo and the 2i2, uh, you know, like the PreSonus, we have 
a condenser microphone, and I didn't mention this before. Uh, these microphones, this one as well as the Personas, it's cardioid. So for those of you that are new to the, new to the game, um, you can't really see the symbol, but it looks like a heart or maybe little butt cheeks. And what this is telling you is the polar pattern of the microphone. These microphones are side addressed, meaning it's going to pick up here, right? And so uh, with the heart, cardioid, or butt cheeks, it's going to pick up like this and then reject in the back. So just a little bit of microphone theory for you there. Uh, once again, this is a condenser microphone, so it does need phantom power, 48 volts, which both of these boxes will provide. Each one of these comes with a mic cable, a mic clip or mic mount, and this one actually screws into the bottom of the microphone. Your USB cable, which in this case is a type A to a USB 3 or USB C, and headphones, which I'm not going to unwrap because these are really wrapped snugly, and I think we all know what headphones do. So let's start off with the Solo. Now, it's a cute little box. It's metal, it's built really, really well. The thing about Focusrite is they're really known for producing high, highly functional, well-built, well-sounding boxes at a price point that's not gonna break the bank, right? But with the Solo, you are gonna be a little bit limited as to how much functionality you have. And maybe, maybe limited's not the right, right word. If you are a singer-songwriter, this is probably going to be absolutely perfect for you in that you have one mic input, right, for the one microphone. But then you also have an instrument input, okay? So now you can plug your guitar DI directly into here. If you have a, a DI on the, let's say you have a, a Taylor or a Martin or a Fender or a Gibson or whatever, and there is a direct output on that guitar, there's some sort of preamp built into it, and maybe you have uh, an instrument connection uh, for the button strap or connected to the button strap at the bottom. Strap button, button strap. Well, now you can take the output of that and plug it into here. And now you've got your microphone so you can sing uh, your vocals. You can get your, your lyrical content into the interface as well as uh, your instrument as well, right? Which is really, really nice. And then you have your monitor. So this is your level. And then you also have your headphones, okay? Now on this, you have a button that says direct monitor. Now, with the PreSonus, we had a blend between what was feeding the input and what was coming off the DAW. Well, this is kind of going to kind of do the same thing where you can actually hear the direct input or what's being fed to the box before it hits the DAW, which is great for monitoring in your headphones and making sure that, you're being, that you are in key, or that you're in time. It's important to have a, a solid cue system because uh, the cue system is really ultimately, at the end of the day, gonna help you get a better performance. Um, and then on the back, very, very simple line outputs right and left for your monitors. Now, where the Personas had its headphone output on the back, here you have it on the front. For me personally, that's way more functional, and they still serve the same function, but the functionality of it is, uh, it's just a better design. Maybe I'm using the word function too much. Uh, but this is the Solo One. Very, very cool box. And so the 2i2 actually has two of the dual mic line inputs, and you can also switch it to an instrument input to match the output of your guitar or bass, which is nice. And you can do the same thing with the One as well. There's a little switch that says instrument, and you can click on that, and you can change it from line to an instrument. Um, once again, we have our monitor output. We have our direct monitor so we can get a blend of what's happening with the, the inputs up front or the direct inputs or what's feeding your DAW and what's happening coming out of your DAW. And then we have our headphone output and then we have uh, a headphone level as well, which is quite nice. On the back, just like on the Solo, uh, we only have a left and right out for our monitors. 
but a little more functionality. And one other thing that they offer with the TUI 2 is the air circuit. Now, for those of you that are wondering what the air circuit is, it helps to emulate the Focusrite ISA 110 preamplifier, which is a beautiful preamplifier. I have eight of those in my rack at home. Uh, the original ISA 110 was designed by Rupert Nee. For those of you that already have a little bit of knowledge, or a lot of knowledge, in the recording game, when you hear the word Neve, you automatically think, oh, the godfather of British uh, circuits, audio circuits. Uh, you're gonna hear that name again here as well as I introduce another interface. Uh, but you do have that option. It isn't a true ISA 110 preamplifier. If you want that, you're gonna pay for it, and they're not necessarily cheap. However, if you're looking at other preamplifiers like Neve 1073s and, and APIs and whatnot, you're gonna find that the ISA 110 is more affordable than some of those other high-end pre's, and it's one of my favorite pre's of all time. But you have that option to emulate that type of preamplifier using both of these inputs, which is a great option. Now, uh, depending on your path, what you're trying to do, you know, if you're a singer-songwriter, as I said, mic input, instrument, instrument input, that might be all you need. If you are getting into hip hop, electronic music, or you have stereo instruments or whatever it may be, having both of these be switchable from mic to line to instrument is, is going to probably benefit you a little bit more, especially if you're playing in the electronic music realm. And once again, you're starting to dive into the hardware instrument world a lot of those instruments are going to be stereo. Heck, a lot of those instruments have multiple outputs. Uh, so this might better suit your needs. Uh, both of these are also gonna fall uh, right around the $300 mark. The 2i2 is a little bit more. Um, but again, you know, for the money, when you're, when, when you're talking about quality and not just brand recognition, I could care less what the brand is. I'm more interested in how it's going to sound and what types of facilities it's going to offer. Focusrite is really, really hard to beat because the pre's on here are gonna sound great, the converters are pretty darn good, and it's not gonna break the bank, especially if you're just getting started. Focusrite. All right, so I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit as far as connectivity is concerned, and we're gonna stay with Focusrite just for uh, one more box. Uh, so this is the Scarlet 4i4, and the other two were part of the Scarlet line as well, in case I didn't mention that. They also have the Claret line which uh, kind of moves you up a little bit in regards to the, the, the uh, caliber of the preamp and the converter. Uh, so the Scarlet 4i4, uh, more connectivity. We're gonna go ahead and pull it out real fast. Uh, not a whole lot here other than the USB cable and the box itself. Um, so here we go, here we go. Some really tacky tape. And yes, kabam. So the 4i4. So what we have here on the front, uh, once again, we have uh, the dual inputs. So we have our mic line as well as uh, instrument and we can switch uh, between instrument and um, line. We have our gain. We have our 48 volts, once again, phantom power for our condenser microphones. Uh, we have our monitor uh, control here, as well as our headphone control. Now we don't have that blend, once again, uh, which might be accessible in the uh, Focusrite software. Uh, I have to dig back a little bit. Um, I can probably look that up. I, I'm not probably, I know I can look it up. I'm totally capable and add that in the comments below because I, it's escaping me right now. Now, what we do have on the back is now we have four line outputs and we have two more line inputs, right? So 4i4, 4 in, 4 out. Uh, these line outputs can be used for monitors or if you want to maybe patch into outboard gear, you can do that as well, which is pretty nice. Uh, but you will lose a couple of outputs if you're, if you're or uh, excuse me, an output and an input if you're patching into outboard gear because you have to feed the input and the output of the outboard gear to access the compressor, EQ, and I'm kind of jumping ahead even though this is a beginning uh, entry level type of video. I'm jumping ahead a little bit in our theory, uh, but just letting you know that things, other things are possible. Now this also adds your five pin MIDI in uh, and MIDI out. So once again, if you have hardware instruments that have uh, the five pin MIDI uh, protocol, 
Well, now you can use those, or you can use this as an interface, and you can connect to the outside world with some of your MIDI gear. Um, so once, once again, as I said, you lose a little bit of functionality, but you also gain some functionality. Uh, you also have uh, pads that can be enabled on here, which can be accessed through the Focusrite software I'm now remembering. And you also have the air mode, so you can uh, tap into that ISA 110 type of feel again. Uh, it is an emulation, okay? Please remember that. But it's nice to have more inputs and more outputs, especially as you start getting a little more advanced with your productions and how much you want to incorporate going uh, into the box as you're starting to record. Having four inputs, it's not a big jump, but it's certainly better than having two. Um, so that is the 4i4. I just wanted to present this as an option. It does connect via uh, USB-C. Uh, and uh, I also want to mention uh, these Focusrite boxes also come with software where the Personas box came with Studio One and some other packages. Uh, Focusrite gives you a, a, basically an, an intro to Pro Tools, Ableton, as well as some sample libraries and a couple of instruments. So, uh, you know, as I had stated, learning Pro Tools is pretty important, especially if you want to advance as a professional recording engineer. Because once again, almost every commercial recording studio posting facility is going to be using Pro Tools. They're not going to be using Ableton or Logic or uh, Adobe Audition. Uh, just not very common. I'm not saying that they're, that, that they're not being used because they are certainly being used, but in the professional world, you can't go wrong learning Pro Tools. Uh, if you are a turntablist, hip-hop, electronic person, Ableton's probably the way to go. And once again, if you're a composer, Logic is really, really popular. But this is just another option. This does not come with the bundle, so you would need to purchase microphones, microphone cables, stands, headphones, instrument cables, all the accoutrements that come with the other boxes do not come with this. This is just the interface. So the Scarlet 4i4 from Focusrite. Next up, we have a couple of interfaces from Universal Audio. These are the volts. We have the uh, 176 and the 476. So let's go ahead and take these out of the box and look at what they have uh, as far as functionality and features. So, do that. And here we go. The Volt 176. This is a really pretty box. It, it, aesthetically, it's incredibly attractive with uh, what appear to be uh, it's like pine cheeks, um, and then it has a, a steel or a metal chassis. Feels really good, uh, looks beautiful. So the Volt 176 from Universal Audio doesn't have a lot of connectivity, especially when we're talking about inputs. We really only have one input on here, one. It is dual, it's a dual input, so you have your mic line and or instrument. We have an instrument button here. We also have our phantom power, 48 volts. We have our volume for our headphones. So once again, our headphones are accessible from the front of the device. Um, we have our monitor level, which is gonna feed our monitors in our studio. We have our gain for our preamplifier. We have the 1176 style compressor that we can engage, and we can also uh, engage this vintage mode for the preamp, which to my understanding emulates a 610 tube uh, style uh, microphone preamplifier, which were very, very popular uh, back in the 60s when, when Bill Putnam uh, first put them into production. Now on the back, we have our monitor outputs. Once again, five pin MIDI, uh, the five pin DIN protocol or norm, so you can interface with any sort of uh, hardware instruments you have out here in the real world. USB-C connection. This can be USB powered. You can power over the USB bus. But depending on what you're doing, like let's say you're using your iPad, you probably want to use a wall wart and you want to feed this. Uh, it's five volts DC or five volts direct current. And then you have your power switch. Um, we also have a direct button on here as well, which is going to allow us once again to uh, also monitor what's happening 
at the input so we're not experiencing latency, which I didn't discuss latency before and I probably should. If you're recording something, maybe you're doing some really fast guitar licks or piano keyboard licks or synth or whatever, if you have latency, it's really gonna mess you up because you're gonna be hearing something, whatever's coming up, whatever that something is, coming off of your DAW and as you're playing, it, there's gonna be a slight delay. If you have the direct button engaged and you can hear what's happening on the input and you're not experiencing uh, any kind of delay, but there's also ways that you can circumvent that by changing your buffer settings in your DAW. Now, Universal Audio has their own DAW now called Luna. I have not used it yet because I don't have a whole lot of time to be experimenting with, with other DAWs. So I've already got a whole bunch of knowledge in my head that's both coming and going uh, using the various DAWs that I use, primarily Pro Tools. But from what I understand, it works really, really well. Again, I haven't used it, so I don't have an opinion. Knowing Universal Audio, uh, I am a, a diehard fan of the UAD plugins. That's pretty much all I use in my sessions when I'm using plugins. That and Sound Toys uh, when I'm trying to manipulate space, modulation, and things like that. And Sound Toys has a couple of really great filter EQs or filter uh, plugins as well. Um, but the Universal Audio plugins, when we're talking about emulations, well, the people that have developed Universal Audio, Bill Putnam or Yuri, the best compressors uh, to my ears or Universal Audio with the 1176, the 1178, the LA2, the LA2A, LA3A, LA4A, and their emulations are absolutely stellar. Uh, so now they also have the option for you to use some of these, these plugins natively without having the Universal Audio um, processors. I, I don't have any Universal Audio um, Converters in my setup at home, I use, I use all Apogee uh, Symphony with a separate Rosetta for my stereo output, uh, but I do have three satellites so I can really stack plugins in sessions and I love their plugins, but their interfaces sound great too. And we have actually demoed these interfaces on the guitar channel, I think on the Pro Audio channel, or maybe it was the Pro Audio channel, I can't remember. Um, we produce a lot of content, but it was me and Cooper um, with a couple of warm microphones using the Universal, universal Audio uh, boxes, the Apollos, um, from what I remember, and they sound really, really good. These sound good, too. I've heard them. They're excellent at the price point. You can't beat it, but you do only have one input, so we should probably look at the four. So here we are with the four. Now, our connectivity has increased significantly with more inputs, more outputs, different ways to monitor, if you're just getting into this game, uh, this could be a little too much to chew on. However, four inputs, not pushing it too far. You know, it's not 20 inputs, 20 live inputs, where it's, whoa, what's going on? Something's crackling somewhere, what is it? Um, but with this, you know, once again, we have the beautiful cheeks, it's a beautiful build. <clears throat> we now have more inputs and outputs, as I stated. You know, the, we have our two inputs here which can serve uh, multiple purposes, mic, line, instrument. We have those switches once again. We have our phantom power, which is gonna feed phantom power to both uh, uh, mic inputs. Uh, for those of you that are um, mic aficionados or you're, or you're thinking about getting a ribbon microphone, you probably don't wanna feed phantom power to ribbon microphone because you can burn out the element. We have our headphone output here once again with our volume. Like on the one with the uh, four, we have our microphone or uh, preamplifier gain, trim, whatever you want to call it. 76 compressor, the vintage mode. Uh, and I should state that whenever you engage these, you're going to be recording with these engaged. It's going to be in line. It's going to be in the microphone path. So if you instantiate the 76 or the vintage mode, you're going to record that into your DAW. Uh, we can switch our output to mono, which is nice. We have our monitor control. And then we have monitor sources as well. Three, four, one, two, out three and four, out one and two. And then on the back, we have two more line inputs. We have separate outputs for our monitors. And then we have four additional outputs if you're feeding a mixer. Or once again, maybe you're incorporating outboard gear into your mix. Maybe you have a beautiful compressor or EQ that you like to use on vocals. 
Well, now you can use hardware inserts, uh, five pin MIDI DIN once again, uh, power, USB-C, it connects via USB-C. Always power this. You always want to feed power to this unit, otherwise you're probably gonna run into some problems. Um, and that is my suggestion there. So, you know, again, we've, we've gone from one input to four inputs. And this is probably gonna be better suited for people that are using, um, you know, hardware instruments. Uh, maybe you have, uh, you know, a vocalist and a guitar player, and then you have V drums or an SPDX or something like that, then you can actually insert, or you can record those two at the same time. You have four inputs total. These two inputs on the front are the ones that are gonna give you the 76 emulation, which is, uh, and I don't know that I said this before, 76 or an 1176 uh, is a uh, FET style compressor. Really, really cool. Lots of functionality. You can really manipulate and change the parameters on an 1176. However, you can't do that here. Um, when you turn it on, there's, I believe, two different settings for the 76 uh, that you can, that you can uh, incorporate. But highly functional, uh, once again, not gonna break the bank. And um, the Universal Audio plugins, again, are my favorite. I really think that they are unmatched in the industry. I know people will argue with me regarding that. That's fine, we all have our own opinions. There is gray area in the universe, which is a beautiful thing. We should explore the gray more. The 11, or excuse me, the Volt 476 from Universal Audio. And of course, the one which you already saw. And finally, we have a couple of boxes from Steinberg. Literally, these are boxes, right? Uh, by box, I mean interface. I'm not gonna open both of these up. I'm just gonna open up the URRT2. And the reason being is that they are configured in ex the exact same fashion. The big difference is this, and as I had mentioned the Neve name before, well, this has some Neve technology incorporated into it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and push this over to the side. I'm not saying that this is not worthy of our time, it most certainly is, but there's no point in covering it twice when the boxes are configured the same way. So we'll take the UR242, move it over here. There is about a $170 price difference between these two as well, but I'm gonna explain that in just a couple of seconds. So let's go ahead and unpack this critter. So the first thing I noticed immediately is the build quality on this interface, and it is astounding. I think I could probably hammer nails with this. It's like the SM57 of uh, smaller converters. This is a solid, solid build. Now, the URRT2, uh, as you can see, on the front, we have, and this is a big trend, right? We have the dual inputs. You have your XLR, or your instrument, which can also be line. We have an instrument switch here as well, or it says, in this case, it actually says high Z or high impedance to match what's happening on your guitar or bass guitar. We come over here, we have our gain pots, and God, these feel really good. There's just the right amount of give to them. Uh, so this is for our inputs and how much we want to open our up, how much we want to open up our preamp. And then we have our headphone uh, trim. Headphone output, once again, it's on the front, right? You see the trend there? Like, it just makes more sense to have it on the front, does it not? And then we have our monitor output. If we go to the back of the box, five pin DIN, once again, we have our main output left and right, which is going to, uh, be, f or which is going to be fed from this output right here, the monitor output. We have two more line inputs, so we actually have a total of four inputs on here. Five pin DIN, uh, five pin DIN uh, MIDI protocol, so we can connect uh, uh, hardware instruments, drum machines, whatever, and this becomes our, our MIDI interface, if you will. Uh, it connects over USB 2.0, so it's gonna be type A to type B, more than likely, and then we also have our uh, power for our wall wart. So this is not gonna be powered over USB. Now the Neve name. This has Neve input transformers that are tethered or connected to the input, right? So we can engage the Neve transformer and the transformer is gonna give the signal a lot more weight. It's gonna give it color. That's what transformers do ultimately. They're going to um, be coupled to either the input or the output, sometimes both times. It's a transformer balanced input or output. And depending on 
the type of metal that's used in the transformer, well, that metal is going to influence the input and or the output of the device. In this case, it's tethered to the input, as I said, and it's gonna give your signal a different flavor. Uh, you know, Neve has been making instruments, oddly enough, in Wimberley, Texas, for quite some time now. And of course, uh, Rupert passed away. Uh, gosh, I guess it's just been a couple of years. I, I had the very, very great honor of meeting Rupert in 1998 at Stardog Studio in Austin, Texas, uh, which was, was owned by Mike Castoro. Mike Castoro now owns Wonder Audio. So for those of you that are gearheads, uh, I got my start working for Mike at his studio in Austin. Made a bunch of really, really crappy sounding records and a few good ones. I was learning as I went. Um, but the Neve name, don't underestimate the name. Know that you're paying for a quality and a sound that you're not gonna get anywhere else. There are a lot of vintage Neve clones today when we're talking about the 1073s, the 1066, the 1081s, uh, 2254 compressors, 33609s, the list goes on and on and on. I have a vintage Neve console in my home studio. It's called a 5542 with 34128 um, channels, IOs. Um, you just, when it comes to the sound of rock and roll, uh, you could ask Dave Grohl this or you could watch the documentary Sound City. The sound of Neve is, is and has been stamped on so many of your favorite records of all time. And we're not just talking about rock and roll. We're also talking about hip hop. We're talking about electronic music. I know that Aphex Twin uses um, 1073s, I believe, uh, in his setup. Um, a lot of people, uh, lean on Neve. Now the newer Neve product, when I say 1073, 1066, 1084, 1081s, uh, that's all the vintage stuff. And Neve has been through you know, many transitions, but this is from Rupert Neve Designs, which once again exists in Wimberley, Texas, which is only about an hour drive from San Antonio. They're making consoles and, and compressors and 500 series gear and all kinds of stuff today uh, that you might wanna look into later. But when you buy this converter or this interface from Steinberg, you're gonna get a little bit of that knee flavor on the front end. And you know, it's a hundred, it's a, an additional $170 spin uh, from the UR242, but it might be something that uh, you should look into. You know, your curiosity should be piqued because Neve really is considered uh, you know, the godfather of, of all British audio circuits. Such a, such a great sound, and, and I'm not discounting SSL. I love that company too. I, I love mixing on SSL consoles, but I love tracking on Neve consoles because they have such a great sound. So Steinberg, you know, look into it. And it also comes with a version of Cubase. Now Cubase uh, is another DAW slash uh, MIDI sequencer. I use Cubase a lot. Um, back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Um, it's been kind of a staple in the MIDI world. Um, as far as the DAW, I couldn't tell you a whole lot about the functionality other than it's DAW and it's gonna record audio and allow you to manip manipulate it. Um, but this is certainly a great option. Sounds killer, build is great, a little bit more of a spend, but it, it, again, it's something that you might wanna look into. So look into Steinberg. So there you have it. And as I said at the beginning of this video, there really are just a, an unlimited amount of choices you have when it comes to the interface world. And, and you know, as I had said uh, during the, the demo or the unboxing of uh, these different interfaces, we didn't really demo them, we just looked at them. Um, you, you know, if you're just getting started, I think having an interface that has eight or more inputs might be a little overwhelming, but, but you, that is not really a decision I can make. That's something that, that's a decision that you have to make. That's something that you need to really mull over and, and think about because you don't want to, you don't want to overwhelm yourself with, with too much information, uh, especially as you start getting into, you know, deep, deeper track densities when you're starting to mix and, and all that. Having too many inputs might be overwhelming, uh, but it just depends, you know, on, on how, how, on how fast you're moving and, um, you know, what you think you can, you can take on. If, if you're just getting started, you know, as I said, you know, having more than two inputs is probably too much. And these are gonna, you know, cover all kinds of ground, whether you're a singer-songwriter, maybe you're getting into the hip-hop game, maybe you wanna have a couple of inputs because you want to incorporate more hardware synthesizers in your MIDI setup, or you wanna get outside of Ableton or Pro Tools or Fruity Loops or, um, 
logic whatever DAW you're using to incorporate hardware. Uh, but, but again, if you have too much on your plate, it, it can become overwhelming to try to manage all that, you know, gain staging and making sure all your levels are good. Watching all that in real time, uh, it, it takes a little bit of practice. And, and you know, even sometimes when I'm in the studio and I, and I have, you know, maybe 20, 24 live inputs at one time, it, I mean, that's still 25 years in the game. That is a lot to juggle. So, you know, I hope the information that I gave you today has been valuable and is going to help to inform you where you need to start on your path of becoming a recording engineer or uh, just a, a home recordist. And uh, I think that any of these can be a, a great launching point. It just depends on, you know, what your path ultimately will be or if you really want to, di to diversify uh, later on. So with that being said, uh, you know, we are in the holiday season, so happy holidays to everybody. Please be kind to each other. Keep on creating. Let's have a meaningful conversation uh, down in the comments below. If there's something that I missed or that I didn't cover or something that you have uh, a question on, uh, whether it be the connectivity or sample rates, bit depth, you know, uh, digital audio theory, whatever, please don't hesitate to ask. I try to get to them whenever I can. I'm pretty busy on the outside, but I do like to continue conversations. And of course, you can reach out to me at civilianaudio.com on, on my own website. Um, so I'm signing off. Uh, I'm Chris Klein, Alma Music in San Antonio. Thanks for tuning in, and I look forward to seeing you next year. Bye-bye.